Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, name is a Bitcoinistim. IDSF is a leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend the state of Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be joined today by Dr. Uzi Rubin, uh, who served as the head of the Israel Defense uh, Missile Systems from 1991 to 1999 and oversaw the development of the Aero Anti-Missile Defense System and uh, is the recipient as well as the very, of the very prestigious Israel Defense Prize for all of his work in missile defense. Dr. Rubin, thank you so much for joining today. Hi, you're welcome. So uh, there's obviously a lot to discuss with regards to uh, what happened with Iran, both the missiles that they sent and Israel's uh, superb defense. Uh, maybe we can begin, if you can just share a little bit about the different components of Israel's missile defense system, just so that we're all understanding the different terminology here. Yeah, well, uh, first I understand that uh, missile defense works like air defense. Right? You need a radar to see the incoming threats. You need some kind of a battle management, a lot of computers uh, to tell the interceptors when to go out. And, and then we have the interceptors. These are the three basic building blocks. So we, we have actually three systems with four different separate different uh, interceptors. Uh, the first and the original one was Arrow 2. Uh, it has a radar, big big radar, battle management system, it's computerized, a computerized room, and there's an interceptor itself called Arrow 2, which is designed to intercept inside the atmosphere, but very high intercept on the, on the border of space, tens of kilometers. Uh, next in line comes Arrow 3, which is Part of the same system, but it's a different interceptor. It's like in a Patriot system, you have Patriot Pack 2 and you have Patriot Pack 3. It's two different rounds, but actually they, it's, it's fired from the same system. So the same system fires Aero 2 and the inter, new interceptor, Aero 3, which is exoatmospheric. That means it inter, intercepts in uh, deep space. Uh, uh, next uh, comes uh, uh, the, um, David Sling which is a system designed to engage and destroy heavy rockets and short range ballistic missiles and uh, UAVs and uh, cruise missiles. Uh, last but not least, the most famous one is of course ILO Dome, which is basically a short range defense system. Uh, the principle is to have a very low cost interceptor, relatively speaking. So it can be produced in mass and uh, block uh, Mass nice rays of uh, uh, large salvos of rockets that's coming from Gaza and came from Lebanon, coming from Gaza. So th these are the four, the, the three systems and the four interceptors that we have. Thank you for clarifying that. So let's get into one of the tough questions that people keep sending around, uh, which is: Did Iran have reason to believe that their attack on a, on April fourteenth? Would, would be able to best Israel's missile defense system. There are those who claim that both Israel and Iran knew that the attack would be easily thwarted. How would you respond to that? <laughs> this is, you know, always, you always hear this, this kind of uh, collusion stories when uh, things go well. Go well. Uh, no, there was no collusion. Uh, the Iranians launched the most massive raid ever on Israel, not only in, 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 in Middle Eastern terms, but in, in global terms. Uh, the raids of the Russians in Ukraine are not that large. They are sending the tech packages, same thing of tech packages, a mix of uh, mixed ballistic missiles and uh, uh, UAVs and cruise missiles. But you are talking there about a, a tech package of 50, 60, 70 threats. But here you can more than 300 threats, 313 threats. This is, uh, this is the largest ever uh, recorded in the Middle East or everywhere up to now. So no doubt it was a serious, it was a serious attack. Yes. In terms of looking at the future, future attacks from Iran or future attacks from Hezbollah, are there greater threats that lie ahead? Let's say 
potentially what Hezbollah could send into Israel versus what just... Yes, of course, it's a, matter of, it's a matter of quantities. Uh, both the Iranians and Hezbollah have a lot more missiles than the fire, and uh, it's a matter of firepower, our uh, defensive firepower against our offensive firepower, which is going to um, overcome the other, I, I cannot say now, because I don't have, I'm not in the picture of the threat scenario, but uh, and, and of course, I'm out of the systems, so I don't know all the size of our defense system, but it's, it's pitting the, our firepower against their firepower. And in terms of looking at Hezbollah, are the is the missile uh, concern from Hezbollah much greater than that of Iran? Well, they seem to have made many more uh, short-range uh, rockets, and they are closer than Iran. So j just to clarify, being closer um, makes it a much greater threat in terms it's, of our it's, response it's a, time? It's a different threat because... Both the response and the fact that you can use short range rockets. Uh, the Iranians cannot use short range rockets. They are too far away, they're 1,200 kilometers. The, 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 the Lebanese, the, the Hezbollah is on the border. Right. And I know your time is uh, very precious. Let me ask you one final question, if I can. Um, if Iranian ballistic missiles carried nuclear warheads, uh, would that change Israel's defense system? Um, would Israel need to alter or up its game, so to speak? Meaning now that Israel has demonstrated it can shoot down it, Iranian rockets, would arming them with nuclear uh, warheads change uh, change Israel's strategy? Our defense systems are designed against missiles which carry anything. Could be explosives, uh, chemical warheads, nuclear warheads. The defense system doesn't distinguish between nuclear and non-nuclear missiles. It, tries to shoot them down all and design to shoot them down all. Okay. It doesn't mean that we, our, our effectiveness is not 100%. We have to realize that. We don't have a perfect system. It's always some missile like the Iranian attack, some missile go through. Sure. Well, Dr. Rubin, thank you for answering these questions and thank you for all that you have done to build out these systems. Clearly they work and a large part of that is because of uh, um, what you did during your uh, time developing the system. So thank you so much. Thank you for your kind word. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye now. Okay, take care. And it's a great pleasure now to uh, be joined by the head of IDSF Research, Or Isachar, or thank you for joining. Hi everyone, great to be here. Or you spend a lot of time uh, analyzing Iran and the threat from Iran. Uh, before we jump into some harder questions, can you give your overall analysis and view uh, of what happened? Absolutely. Um, if you could let me uh, share my screen. Great. By the time you do that, the first thing I'll say is that Iran has been an actor in this war for over six months. Needless to say, over four decades, but even more intensely over six months. Um, ever since October 7, you know, we had quite a hard time to uh, deliver the message that actually it's not the Israel-Gaza war, it's the first Israel-Iran war. If you follow our uh, research papers, if you follow our interviews, we see it in every single time. This is an Iranian campaign of some seven fronts. Gaza is the most intense fear of them. There's also Lebanon, over 3,000 attacks by Hezbollah. Um, you got Syria, you got the Houthis in Yemen who already launched drones and ballistic missiles at Israel. You got the militias in Iraq. And so all of Judea and Samaria, all these theaters really affect Israel. And we had struggled until now to convey the message to the international community that it is not really uh, Israel's war against the Palestinians in Gaza. It, it is a seven-front Iranian campaign against Israel. This is the way we framed it in our papers. This is the way we always talked about it. But for some reason, um, I guess, you know, the public opinion needs uh, to visualize the message, as they say. And uh, it is only it has only been when Iran itself attacked Israel itself, not through proxies, um, only then you suddenly hear voices that say um, how um, how profound and uh, brazen attack it was by by Iran, and I think really it shows it doesn't matter really how 
how far you go in trying to explain that actually it's not Hezbollah, it's Iran standing behind it, it's the puppeteer. Uh, it's not just Hamas, it's also Iran, who on October 7 provided much of the ammunition found on the terrorists on October 7. You got Iranian grenades, Iranian RPGs, Iranian Lao missiles, Iranian MK-47. Um, so they really flooded the Gaza Strip with ammunition. Uh, you talk about the Houthis in Yemen who blocked the Bab al-Manda Red Sea passage. All these things have one address, all roads lead to Tehran. And we tried to convey that message for months now. And it is, again, it was only when Iran itself launched the attack, only then, you know, the international community started to say the word Iran again. And to be honest, it was a bit, um, it, it is now the masks are off. It was quite a watershed moment in Middle East history because everyone now knows who the real um, the stabilizing actor in the Middle East, who's the real malign actor, which is, which is Iran. And, you know, we've been talking about it for long, and now it's time to actually have some, you know, action and uh, have the international community acting against Iran, not pressuring Israel to end the war against an Iranian proxy in Gaza and not pressuring Israel to accept a ceasefire against an Iranian proxy in the north, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, not to have international coalitions against the Houthis in Yemen, and pretending it's not has nothing to do with Iran, it's just targeting a few Houthi, uh, a few Houthi uh, targets in Yemen. Now we all know it's Iran, and now our case, um, it is much easier for us to make our case that it, it is the head of the snake, head of the octopus, whatever animal you choose, that it needs to be uh, targeted. And what it, what Iran did, uh, I think, can be best explained. What Israel responded to the Iranian attack can be best explained by this picture. I don't know if you saw it, but 99% intercepted. That's really uh, the success rate. What happened was that Iran decided to retaliate for what it saw as the Israeli attack against um, an Iranian consulate in Damascus, where an Iranian general called uh, Mohammed Zahedi, a commander, a senior commander of the Quds Force, alongside his uh, five advisors, uh, was eliminated in Damascus. Now, um, Israel didn't take officially, uh, didn't take responsibility for this uh, targeted killing. I will say that had it been Israel, you know, you can't just disconnect it from uh, the context. Um, it, um, you, I, I got a lot of messages saying that, um, you know, Iran decided to retaliate for what you did in Damascus. Of course, that's what they, they're going to do. But then again, um, if it was Israel who did it, it was not out of the blue. It was, a, 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 I believe it was a decision to finally make, make justice with people who attacked Israel over and over and over again for the past six months and for the past two decades. Um, the, the certain gentleman who was uh, eliminated in Damascus and his advisors were part of the Quds Force, whose day job was to get up in the morning and instigate terror attacks against Israel. Over 3,000 of them. Uh, from Lebanon prominently, but also from Syria uh, ever since October 7. Last year, we had multiple uh, attacks that he orchestrated in the past two decades. Uh, these guys' uh, job description was to kill Jews and Israelis. So if Israel did it, it was not out of the blue. It was a decision to eliminate a big, big factor in the Iranian destabilizing game in Syria and in Lebanon. Um, and Iran said, okay, enough is enough, time to retaliate. And to be honest, the reason why it was a watershed moment in Middle East history is because Iran itself attacked Israel uh, with uh, over, uh, with hundreds, over 350 uh, missile, cruise missiles, ground-to-ground -to -ground missiles, and attack drones from Iran itself and from Yemen uh, directed at Israel. And the uh, what Uzi said earlier was absolutely right. I mean, he said, well, you can't just assume that they, they knew they would fail. They just did it uh, as a hush money or something to um, to to uh, sort of get rid of their um, uh, honor, let's say, the dignity and restore the dignity and move on with their lives. If 350 um, warheads were to explode in on Israeli soil, that's 60 tons of explosive. Um, Shahid 136 drones, uh, you got advanced cruise missiles, you got all their uh, long-range ballistic missiles going onto the atmosphere and landing on the ground. All these things are not a child's play. They can kill thousands of civilians had they 
had their plan, had them made good on their plan. Uh, if it was not for the Israeli defense systems and their partners around the region, very easily you would have hundreds, if not thousands, of dead Israelis today. I'm not, this is not uh, to overstate this. Um, so why did it fail? Well, as you can see, I think uh, one of the reasons why it was such a big success uh, was what it, what uh, they call need the Middle East air defense. Now, following the Abraham Accords, you had not just nice ceremonies in the White House and increasing trade. Um, Israel actually reinforced its ties with the Arab world. It started with the Abraham Accords and continued to Israel joining CENTCOM. Remember General Kirillo visiting Israel just a few short days before the attack? Um, he, he, he's not just commanding you know, the U.S. CENTCOM, the Central Command uh, of U.S. forces. It, joined, it puts together um, actually uh, both Israeli and Arab forces. So in the past three years, we witnessed Israeli and Arab militaries uh, drilling together, uh, like uh, participating together in military drills in the uh, seas of the Persian Gulf, for example. This was unheard of in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, unheard of. So this is, um, I think, a new Middle East alliance of Israel and Arab countries deciding to act against Iran. Okay, not all of these Arab countries will tell you that, yeah, this is what we did because we oppose Iran and we support Israel. It's not what they're going to do. But they will cooperate, give their tacit approval, or just cooperate under the radar, giving intelligence, giving access to radar information, uh, letting the Americans place their end of systems on, in their territory. And that's what the result. So most of these... Let's say you had 350 missiles. They said 50 of them actually failed and uh, were misfired. They just landed not not, uh, not a lot of time after being launched. You had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 270 drones, attack drones who were downed by the Israeli Air Force. You had over 170 ballistic missiles who just a fraction of them um, reached Israel causing minor damage. Uh, you saw the famous videos uh, on top of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, you, so um, some of them reached Israel and didn't cause damages except very minor damages to the Nevatim base. According to what the IDF said, they targeted the Air Force Nevatim base in the south. This was one of their targets. And you had over 30 cruise missiles. Uh, none of them reached Israel. So you really had Israeli pilots with F-35s over the skies of Iraq and Jordan intercepting one after another, one missile after another, one drone after another. You had a sea dome, as they call it, um, the air defense system un, uh, installed on top of Israeli ships. You had American ships intercepting drones and missiles. You had American air defense systems intercepting them. And you had British and French aid, both with pilots and with um, other means. Uh, most of them, I got to tell you, with all due respect and with it was a, a fabulous demonstration of Middle East unity against Iran. Most of these weapons were intercepted by Israel. Israeli pilots, Israeli Iron Dome, Israeli Arrow. Uh, but the support was crucial to act uh, above the skies of Iraq and Jordan to, um, to have American uh, interception um, um, domes and, and systems to, in, to intercept these missiles. British pilots participating. So when that happens, it's not, this is what I'll say for conclusion, it's not just, you know, them doing the act of intercepting a missile. It's far beyond that. It's them understanding by participating that the genuine threat is Iran. No, but if UK foreign minister, David Cameron, goes on an interview and says, Iran did a, you know, a shameless attack and our British pilots participated and were committed to Israel's defense, this is very different from the way he spoke to weeks ago. On Israel, how it occupies Gaza, how it could totally stop, uh, you know, committing uh, acts of uh, genocide, whatever it was, against uh, the Gaza people, Palestinians in Gaza, how it should up its uh, humanitarian support. So all these things became secondary, and the Iran threat became primary. And uh, this is really the way I, I, we, we wanted this to be. I assume I, I think this is the way, the proper way to see things. Um, and really a great time for uh, Middle East defense. Now I think Israel must uh, act decisively unproportionately attack um, strategic assets in Iran, um, not just to foil an attack, 
already heard some voices we can talk about in the Q&A that say, okay, you got your win, now be smart, not tough. I don't accept that. Iran should, not, should know that if it attacks Israel, it should not be normalized. And it cannot continue to just launch missiles, and then we just move on with our lives. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Israel must give Iran the, the retaliatory response uh, that, uh, that it deserves. And with that, uh, let's take some questions. Or thank you so much. That illustration is very powerful. And one of the things that makes this abundantly clear is that all of those projectiles go through Saudi Arabia, not just Jordan and Iraq. So can you share a little bit about what's, what is the thinking right now in Saudi Arabia in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the, the newfound threat that they see from Iran, like having projectiles coming through their airspace? Yeah. And also the extent to which the Saudis cooperated with Israel during the attack. Uh, look, I think it's not new. Okay, so we already had the Saudis intercepting uh, Houthi missiles, the Iranian missiles from Yemen, in a few, a few months ago, and um, you know they have uh, you know hot romance with Israel under the radar for for years now. They've been having it, and um, I think Saudis really have a genuine problem of quote-unquote, outing their relations with Israel. Um, they want to see real progress in the Palestinian front before doing such thing. And then October 7 happened. No, Israeli-Saudi normalization, it never stopped. In my estimate, it would have happened if it wasn't for October 7 and the war. We've already seen Israeli-Saudi normalization. I heard very senior people talk about it very openly. And um, But now I think you see how Blinken, even Dermer, have some, you know, relations with the Saudis going on, on uh, in and out, uh, meeting them. Um, so that's probably a good indication. And the Saudis, they um, tacitly and under the radar participate in that uh, American-led coalition, which is um, the both CENTCOM, like the Central Command of the United States. Um, so they contribute. They, they won't necessarily send Saudi pilots, but they would contribute with radars, with allowing Americans to act uh, to put Iron Dome and uh, and Patriot uh, systems and all these um, facilities from within their territory. Here in Israel, people are um, ecstatic about the extent of the success of taking down those missiles. Uh, I know that uh, in synagogues across Israel, there are all types of special prayer sessions and certainly in the military circles, the lauding the success mm -hmm. What was the Iranian reaction? Do they see this as an epic failure or they're just looking at the way they were successful in launching an attack against Israel? Look, they're not going to say, well, we launched and we failed. Right? They're not going to say it. But I will tell you, first of all, that, yeah, um, our great, great pride and our wonderful um, Air Force pilots were, didn't need to be revived, but it still it was uh, reconfirmed um, uh, two days ago, and they just did phenomenally well. I spoke to some of them. I told them, I mean, wow, this was one, uh, you know, firecracker show and well, well done. Um, and they really made made us all proud. Um, they really saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. This is literally the case. Now, Iran, I followed their media um, um, in the past few days, and they seem to be a little confused. Most of them, they mostly quote Israeli media, especially on the night of April the 14th. So they said, well, Israeli media has managed to you know, come to a state of shock and Israeli decision makers seem to be confused. We launched another cruise missile, launched another ballistic missile. And every time like this, it is um, quite uh, to up the game and up the, you know, the dramatic effect. But they have serious censorship right now over what they're allowed to say over these attacks. Um, and they try to frame it as if, yeah, we properly avenged Israel. Iranian people are not stupid. They can see how they tried and failed. I get messages even from uh, people from Iranian origin saying how horrified they were and how much they support us. And, uh, you know, this is um, so heartwarming to see. Or well, thank you for sharing all of this analysis with us. Um, I think we have time for one or two final questions. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of the Israeli Air Force over the years and funding um, all of these uh, airplanes and F-35s and whatnot. And there are those who have argued, take that money and instead of building up the Air Force, use it for other areas within the uh, military establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
based on what just happened, uh, how would you respond to Israel's decision over the years to build up its air force? Yeah, I think it's not mutually exclusive. I think we got to have aerial superiority in the Middle East, period. I mean, F-35 is one heck of a strategic uh, asset, and uh, definitely it wasn't... Uh, it was the the best. It wasn't the wrong consideration to to purchase it. On the contrary, and don't forget, we had not just you know it wasn't just Sadaka, okay? It was just not just United States contributing out of its good grace F thirty five airplanes to Israel. A lot of it, including components engineered in Israeli uh, companies and Israeli uh, military industry. So it was it is an upgraded F thirty five, if we can say so. Um, and uh, I think it was the right decision. I, I, I don't think it's mutually exclusive with the wrong decision to close multiple brigades and to close up divisions and not to, 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 to choose to um, not to summon people to reserve training only once every three years rather than a few months. Uh, it shouldn't be mutually exclusive. Our defense budget should be much larger. Um, we should definitely reopen brigades and re um, like we did right now in Khan Yunus and in northern Gaza to... Um, uh, to really bring back to action tanks who were in the warehouses and were out of date and they were rusty and they needed renovation. All these things aren't acceptable. And the people joining reserve and fighting, you know, with the, uh, as they're fired up, it's not obvious. I mean, this is the, the human resource. It's the pre most precious one. Um, but definitely the defense budget should be even much larger to reopen those divisions, reopen those brigades. Um, uh, and, uh, start having much, much more um, intense uh, reserve routine. Uh, and this is regardless to, you know, the pilots in the Air Force who also do reserve, who also call up until the age of 45 or 50. And, uh, and aerial superiority is definitely, you know, something that Israel cannot give up on. Okay, we got time for one final question, Or, and I tried asking this to Uzi, but his time was short, and I didn't want to push him too hard on it. But in terms of uh, the nuclear aspirations of Iran and uh, them taking these missiles, which Israel can now successfully shoot down and equipping them with nuclear warheads, are, is that still a major, major threat? Or no, Israel can shoot down missiles, doesn't matter what they are uh, filled with. Absolutely an existential threat. Whoever tells you that Iran can become nuclear because Israel will be able to, to intercept it is deluding you is deluding you, okay? It, Iran should never become nuclear. And uh, let me just say that, you know, it is not hermetic, as the idea of spokesperson said multiple times, we are committed to air defense and we are doing the best we can. It is not hermetic. If they launch 10 nuclear weapons on us and even one of them penetrates, this is a disaster. It will be annihilating the state of Israel, such a small country. So I, I'm not suggesting anyone to think lightly of Iran having nuclear weapons. Think about it this way. Iran threatened Israel before the ground operation in Gaza not to operate or uh, Iran will launch a, a, a preventive, like a, an eliminatory uh, strike against Israel, preliminary strike against Israel. Um, he didn't do it, but imagine if Iran was nuclear. Imagine if Iran, a nuclear Iran will tell Israel not to act in Lebanon against Hezbollah, not to act in Syria against its attempts to uh, arm uh, and just put a lot of barricades and, and missile batteries in Syrian so soil. Imagine if Iran put nuclear weapon warheads on Syrian territory like uh, the USSR did in Cuba in the 1960s. So this is unacceptable. And I think um, a nuclear Iran is not just that. This is Iran joining a luxurious club, an elite club of countries. It can definitely threaten Israel to dissuade it from, from defending itself. And it can make a, a hell of a lot of demands that it wouldn't be able to do without nuclear weapons. Um, imagine, as Netanyahu loves to say, it, if, if that's what Iran is doing without nuclear weapons, imagine what they will do with nuclear weapons. Um, it is a strategic weapon. It cannot be allowed to get this. And uh, I think, in my opinion, this is a golden opportunity for Israel to act in Iran and finally put good on its word and uh, make good on its word and actually act against the nuclear facilities in Iran. Uh, I think it's a one in a lifetime opportunity, at least until coming November, if nothing changes. And um, we definitely need to consider this because this, there's no other choice in my opinion. Ori Sakhar, head of IDSF Research. Thank you so much for joining. Pleasure. Thank you to Thank all you. of our viewers. Thank you to all of our supporters. We will be back with you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. here in Israel. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.